In three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Equity Committee for Thursday, February 17, 2022. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of the committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Bass, please call the roll call of board members to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Scott. Present. Dr. Hager. Present. Ms. Jose. Present. Mr. Thomas. Present. And Ms. Rowe. Present. Thank you. Ms. Fass, if you could please call the role of staff member on the committee participating in today's call. Dr. Yarbrough. Present. Mr. Handy. Present. Thank you, Ms. Fass, if you could please call and note the names of any additional staff members participating in today's meeting. Um, Dr. McComas. Dr. Holmes. Ms. Shea. Present. Ms. Fisher. Present. Dr. Grubbs. Uh, Ms. Ferguson. Present. Ms. Schumacher. Present. Ms. Ramin. Present. Ms. Prozer. Present. Mr. O'Brien. Present. And Mr. Sai. Present. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I'd also want to uh, recognize if there are any other board members participating on the call that have not been named. No? Okay. Okay. And so now that our first presentation will be by Dr. Jeffrey Holmes, Ms. Kim Ferguson, Ms. Christine Shoemaker, Ms. Matney Reed Raman, Ms. Michelle Proser, Mr. Justin O'Brien, and Mr. Michael Sai. And it's on the LGBTQ plus non discrimination and support services. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, I'll just do, since we have so many presenters, uh, just want to do a brief intro to get us started. Um, again, this is an item that was requested by Mr. Thomas and agreed to by the fellow committee members. And as Ms. Scott mentioned, the topic is LGBTQ plus non-discrimination and support services. And because of the range of programs and services that were requested, uh, we assembled um, our various staff members here. So at this point, uh, we'll go through our presentation and as uh, staff uh, will go based on the, the slide um, in their area of expertise. So at this point, I will turn it over uh, to to my fellow staff members and Mr. Corns, if you could advance the slide, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kim Ferguson. I serve as the executive director for uh, Department of Social Emotional Supports. Um, and I'll be going through the first few sets of slides I have with me today. Ma'ati Marei Ramin, who is the coordinator of school counseling, and she will talk about uh, school supports towards the end of the uh, presentation, or at least my portion. So I just want to start with um, the fact that the board is committed to fostering the success of every student in every school by creating and maintaining environments that are safe, diverse, and inclusive. For success to occur for each student in lifelong learning in the world of work, the school system prioritizes educational equity by recognizing and removing institutional barriers and ensuring that social identifiers are not obstacles. Disparities based upon race, and this is out of, um, that was policy 0100 equity, 
um, when we look at policy in Rule 4100, um, we uh, want to note that disparities based upon race, special education status, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, including gender expression, English language learner status, immigration status, or socioeconomic status are unacceptable and are directly at odds with the beliefs that all students can achieve. The school system must address and overcome inequity by providing all students with the opportunity to succeed. And then also based, base our actions on the goal of providing educational equity for each student, regardless of their social identifiers. In policy and rule 4100, uh, staff are forbidden uh, to display any discourteous conduct or disrespect to a student, employee, or member of the public when acting in his or her official capacity. And the fact that inappropriate, un unprofessional conduct toward or, re or relations to any person is strictly prohibited. Next slide. Um, in the original request, I was asked to provide some information related to professional development um, around um, this topic. Currently, there are two safe school videos available for staff on supporting LGBTQ students. Um, and in 2018, 2018, the LGBTQ manual was to create it to provide administrative best practices um, for all for all staff named there for our school counselors, school social workers, school psychologists, school nurses, and people PPWs, as well as our administrators. At that time, each one of those uh, representatives listed there, as well as school-based administrators, received professional learning on the contents of this manual. Uh, this current manual is under revision um, because, as I said, it was created in 2018 and does need some update updated language. Students and support staff have participated in the professional learning that addresses the needs of LGBTQ students. Next slide. I also was asked to address the preferred name option um, for students. Um, in the current LGBTQ manual, a process is described by which students can select a preferred gender or, identi or identify a preferred name. That process starts with a student registration form for which a parent permission is needed if the student is under the age of 18. And then that data is entered into the FOCUS SIS. Formerly, as you know, uh, in 2018, we had the former student information system and now our FOCUS SIS has um, picked up the ability to do that as well. Next slide. In the current manual, um, non-discrimination guidelines for restroom and locker room usage of transgender and gender non-conforming students are addressed. Um, in response to physical education and dance, if students need to change for participation, all students are provided with alternative room options such as the use of team rooms, private stall, alternative restroom, etc. Um, note that BCPS em employees or BCPS facilities that have, have been including gender neutral concepts into the new school um, designs. The next slide will be addressed by um, our members of the um, physical education, Ms. Prozer. Next slide, there we go. Thank you, Ms. Ferguson, and I have Justin O'Brien joining me to talk a little bit about our physical education program and about the um, how students are not segregated based on gender. Justin. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Um, I'm Justin O'Brien, Supervisor of Phys Ed, and we schedule all our classes and they're conducted in a co-ed setting. So even during our activities, there's mixed groupings. Um, the students are not segregated based on gender. During, at any time during during phys ed class. We've also provided training with teachers to use non gender specific language. Um, that includes simple things like instead of saying boys line up, girls line up, you know, to call them by shirt colors or something along those lines instead of using that gender specific language. So we've been trying to focus in on getting our teachers to 
kind of diversify their language that they've been using and, and not be gender specific during their classes, during their teaching. Thank you. And I believe the next slide's for athletics. Well, good afternoon. Um, glad to be here. Uh, again, our athletic program is based on inclusion. We want to be able to have all of our student athletes feel like they are part of our athletic program. As we know, the impact that athletics has on our student athletes, both socially and emotionally. Uh, all students deserve the opportunity to participate in school athletics. Uh, our best pra practices are designated to set a, a set of criteria in which student athletes are able to compete on a level playing field in a safe and competitive and friendly uh, environment. Fundamental fairness, as well as most local and state federal rules and regulations require schools to provide transgender and gender non-conforming student athletes with equal opportunities to participate in athletics. These um, athletic uh, practices are conceptualized in a framework which uh, participation may occur in a safe and healthy manner that is fair to all its competitors. Um, it is strongly recommended by our office that all transgender and gender non-conforming student athletes be allowed to play on sports teams based on their self-identified gender be called by their preferred name and referred to by the pronouns that they wish and be permitted to wear clothing and uniforms that correspond with their gender identity expression. Student athletes uh, should not be excluded from participation for the following perceptions. The student athlete may have a, a, a greater uh, physical skill. The student athlete um, gender identity alone is more likely to cause injury than another player and a student athlete may cause a threat um, to any other student athletes on the playing field. So we believe as we put all of these different aspects into play, we are providing uh, an inclusive environment and a safe environment for our student athletes. I believe the next slide. Back to me, um, Mike, thank you. Um, so we were also asked to um, talk a bit about the processes for feedback. Um, in our current stakeholder survey, a third gender option was added, and this actually was added back in 2019. Um, so all student respondents receive a question reading, please identify your gender and offering three choices, female, she or her, her, male, he or him, or another gender ident identity, they or them. Right now, that is the process for stakeholder in, uh, input around um, how students who are identifying, in how students are identifying and how they are faring in school related to the um, the questions that are currently on the stakeholder survey. Next slide. I'm going to have uh, Ms. Ramin talk about support services in schools. Um, and after that slide, um, that'll be the end of our presentation and certainly we'll be able to respond to questions. So good evening. Um, what I would like to say in regards to the supports for students within schools is that the student support personnel provide a number of school based supports, including individual group counseling, classroom lessons on celebrating differences in diversity and referrals to community mental health providers. As students move along their K-12 journey, support staff provide a safe space for students to explore who they are and what they would like to see for their future. Student support personnel are required to operate within ethical standards that include respect for students and family beliefs, um, sexual orientation, gender identification, expression, and cultural background, and exercise great care to avoid imposing personal beliefs or values rooted in one's religion, culture, or ethnicity. Um, for all of the student supports that you see available, um, that would be your school counselor, your social worker, psychologist, nurse, pupil personnel worker, and your community mental health partners. Um, we are here to provide skill building, but also crisis response as needed. Many of our schools also have GSAs, and we also provide professional learning to our individual staff on a variety of topics related to creating a safe space and gender inclusion. Thank you for that. It's, I would assume that's the end of the presentation. <laughs> okay. So, um, 
now I, I suppose we can open it up uh, for questions from board members. Um, uh, Mr. Thomas, if you're there, I, I would like just, oh, you just put it there. I was going to say, <laughs> I'd like to start with you um, because you uh, brought this to the equity committee. So I think that it's, it's only fair that you um, lead us off. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, thank you for that presentation. Um, I have a number of questions, so Ms. Scott, feel free to cut me off and respond to other board members and then come back to me if I'm taking a while. Um, so my first question is about the LGBTQ plus panel. Um, you know, I, we saw on the slide that it was accessible to administrators and a list of other members, but why don't students have access to that manual? Why isn't that on the on the BCBS website? I could not find it anywhere since repairing. I actually went to my school's administrators and got a copy of it from them and printed it out. And if I had known some of this information at the start of sixth grade about the kind of uh, protections that I have about the, the services that are available and about kind of the expectation of staff members and teachers and, 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 and other individuals, then it would have made my experience in, in, in BCBS much easier. So why isn't this accessible online and can it be accessible online? So the document was created as an internal document um, for administrators at the time that it was created in 2018. As I said in the presentation, we are working on revis revising the document and our goal is to have a public facing document as well as a document for staff. Thank you. Do you know when that uh, an updated uh, menu would, would be finished? Is there a time frame on that? Or so yeah. I'll our committee started meeting probably a couple months ago. Um, we actually started meeting pre-pandemic, um, then we were stalled a bit um, and have just started meeting again. Um, we will be meeting in March to start talking again about revising the manual. We hope to have something done before the end of this school year. Um, I just talked to Ms. Ramin earlier today and we talked about trying to accelerate some of that um, work. OK, thank you. Um, the last slide or the slide before this, I believe, uh, shared information about the way that we receive feedback from our LGBTQ plus students is through the stakeholder survey. Um, I'm wondering from that survey, do we find that data as to how many trans and LGBTQ plus students we have in BCPS? Are we finding like the percentage of students that identify as that or are as out as LGBTQ plus? Um, and how is that specifically sharing the perspective of LGBTQ plus students in comparison to other students? OK, so you asked a lot of questions, so let's go one at a time and really fast. So if you can okay. go one, can you sure. start with the first one? <laughs> yes. OK, so the stakeholder survey is the only form of feedback we have from LGBTQ plus students is what was on the slide. Um, and my first question is, does that give us information as to what percentage of LGBTQ plus students we have? You know, how many? out LGBTQ plus students we have in BCPS? So if students um, identify, if they select that third option, then we do have that data from the stakeholder survey. I don't have those numbers with me at this time. I would have to ask representatives that um, that gather that data uh, for the past. And as I said, it didn't start until 2019, so we would only have it uh, since 2019. And the data that was updated in 2019 was just adding a third gender option. Is yes. that correct? Mm -hmm. Was yeah. there also an other option for students that felt like they could define, or is it select all that apply for students that identify as more than one gender, or is it just a third option for they, them? It was a third option for they and them. Okay, and do we have any data for students who are not, um, who are, are, are cisgender and are, are maybe have, are part of the LGBT plus community because they're gay, lesbian, bisexual? Do we have that information, any way to track that information as well? So at, as far as systemic data, um, we have data that is collected by our um, Youth Risk Behavior Survey, um, but that is only at the middle and high school level. As you know, the stakeholder survey goes down to elementary school. So um, no, outside of those two options, no. OK, and when planning for things like the LGBTQ plus manual and other LGBTQ plus services, is the primary source of data then that Youth Risk Behavior Survey? Um, or no, so we, we have some of the youth, um, the, the youth risk behavior survey data, but we also um, have members of our committee who are uh, members of PFLAG um, as well as GLSEN who are on our committee to, to provide us with feedback. Okay, are there students on the committee as well, LGBTQ students? There are, and Ms. Ramin has a list of students who were recommended, um, okay. but I haven't met them yet, so I don't know them personally yet. OK, because it would be great to have some student perspective uh, as well. And yeah, that makes sense. Yes, it does. 
Um, okay, we mentioned that the, some of our schools have GSA clubs. Do you know the total number of GSA clubs that we have? Ms. Romain, do you have that number? I know you were collecting that data. Um, yeah, we don't have the number at this time, but um, as we reconvene over the next month or so, we can get that information for you. Um, we were trying to determine how many and um, just kind of like for each level, um, elementary, middle, high school, um, if it wasn't a GSA, what was that other support that they were providing? So um, we'll be able to get that to you. Okay, well, I, I actually have a list of like, I didn't count it out how many we had, but I asked for a report and a weekly update a, a while back asking um just extra because we had and i think when i was looking through the list there were a number of high schools and middle schools that had them but there were also a number that did not have any lgbtq plus related clubs and so that's what i was bringing that up because you know for me i found a lot of i found a lot of my support in in my gsa in in, in middle school and in high school and i can't imagine not having that in that support circle and i've been talking to students from all throughout the county so i just what kind are there any plans to try to create more of those GSA groups or in, in our offices? Are, are we working to offer more of those student supports from students? So the GSA opportunity is available to all schools. It's one of our EDAs, um, um, our TABCO agreed upon EDAs. So um, what has to happen, certainly Ms. Ramin can talk to um, the school counselors that are at the school to uh, that, that where there are none to determine if there is a need um, based upon what the students are sharing um, with the school counselor. So it, it's available. Um, we just have to uh, make sure that those supports are, are actually put in place. So anybody, we can have schools to, to um, offer the opportunity for the club. We just have to make sure that they do so. Okay. There's, there's no restrictions in other words. Yeah, I've been looking into other counties in, 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 in the state of Maryland, like Howard County and Montgomery County, and I've seen they have also like region wide GSAs, region wide organization groups like the Montgomery County Pride Student Association, where region wide they have students from all of their middle schools and high schools represented and they're giving feedback about their LGBTQ plus um, experiences in school or being LGBTQ plus students and that kind of stuff. Um, and we don't have any type of group like that from what I've experienced and from the supports that I've tried to create. Um, so I'm wondering if maybe that could be something that we could look to try to develop is, is having student support networks for, for LGBTQ plus students outside of just the school building, but countywide, because I think that's one of the best ways we can gain feedback is, is through those sort of groups. So that, that's why I was asking, and I, I, I hope that we can sort of improve upon the this current structures we have for the EDAs and try to create more opportunity. Because even visiting schools, like I went to Patapsco High School, where they had such an incredible and lively GSA. And at Randallstown High School, they have such an incredible uh, LGBT plus group. I can't remember the name off the top of my head. But then there are some schools where they don't have. There are some schools where I'm seeing pride flags on every doorway, every 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 hall. And then other schools where, you know, that sort of like representation isn't there. So that was a little bit of a tangent, but I will move on to my next question. Okay. I actually, if I could um, interject, I, I had a question because it sounds like it's from the presentation and, and, and Mr. Thompson, even what you said is that um, as far as uh, pre, uh, LGBTQ plus, um, it sounds like it's up to the school or, or up to if there's a club and it may vary from school to school. Would that be accurate? The GSA club is, but the, the, the actual, the standards and the guidance is for every, every school in the system. Okay, so it depends, I guess, how active that, um, uh, how active they are at each individual school uh, would show how they are, um, uh, I guess, the presentation, like what Mr. Thomas was saying, having uh, pride flags on doors and, and things like that. Right. Okay. And I also wanted to ask, just briefly, because I know Mr. Um, Thomas, and I'm not sure if he's going to um, bring this up, so I didn't want to, um, sort of interject if you were Mr. Thomas, but I know you brought it up at the last board meeting as far as um, gender neutral bathrooms and things like that. And that was something that I was hoping um, we could speak about. If it's not appropriate or we don't have staff to speak about it today, then maybe we can speak about it at our next equity meeting. Um, but if you are available and, and able to speak about that today, that would be um, great. I am not a, the person to address any facilities concerns. So if you're asking about spe specifically about facilities, no. Okay, I, Mr. 
as far Sorry. as the the what's required. So in our in our current manual, students are have the right to use the restroom of their preferred gender. And they also should be having conversations with administrators about what's most safe for them. Um, but as far as the, the development or the the building of restrooms, no, I, I can't speak to that. OK, that's what I was saying is, is if, if if someone is presenting as female or male, they can use the bathroom according yeah. to how they're presenting. Mm -hmm. And that's in our policy or that's it, it's in the manual that I've been speaking about that was created in 2018. Yes. And that's for all of our schools anywhere. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you for that. And Mr. Thomas, if you had additional questions, you can go ahead. Yes, I do. So what about then our, our gender non-conforming students who don't identify as presenting male or female and don't have a gender? You know, if they're at the last board meeting, uh, I don't remember, I think it might have been Mr. Dixit, uh, said that the 15 to 20 of our new constructions have gender neutral bathrooms. Um, but for the students that don't have gender neutral bathrooms and they're gender non-conforming, you know, how, do, how does that student go about using the restroom? You know, what steps do they have to take to use the restroom, which is just like the fundamental uh, human bodily <laughs> thing right, that we so do. That's a conversation that students should be having with their administrators mm -hmm. about what their preference is. If they want to use a restroom that is a, a single stall restroom in the building, that's something that they would they would have that conversation with their administrators. The our goal is to make sure all students, first of all, are respected, but then they're also kept kept safe and then they feel safe. So um, they would have that conversation with their administrators to ensure that they um, they use the restroom of their choice. OK, so in or when at what point would a student go to their administrator for that? Is like do they have to seek permission from an administrator in order to use to have accommodations to use a restroom or can they begin using the restroom that corresponds to their gender identity when their gender identity corresponds to the gender they need to use, the bathroom they need to use? Or how does that work? Like what's the process to talk you like besides just talking to administrators, like when do they talk to an administrator or is it student specific? And that would, that's based upon a student individual, um, a, a case by case. So I can't say for every kid it starts at this point versus that point. So if that's an individual basis. Did you have something to say, Ms. Ramin? Yeah, I was going to say that um, many times these conversations begin um, with a school counselor. Um, and so that is an opportunity for a student to um, disclose and that stu school counselor can support that conversation with an administrator and sometimes be the person that's advocating um, for that student. And so um, it, it doesn't happen at a period of time um, because I think when you look at that relationship between the student and their school counselor, it's going to be individual if and when you feel you are ready to disclose. And so at that point in time is when you'll find that that conversation would then be initiated with an administrator. So it may not necessarily be the student unless they felt comfortable advocating. It could be that school counselor or another support staff operating um, on that student's behalf. OK, so then let's say that a student does uh, come out to their, their their school counselor and the counselor like is there a procedure that that counselor follows for this or is it looked reference in the manual um, when talking to administrators or like is there a certain procedure that they follow from that or is it kind of just there is no um, particular procedure that we follow. What we receive um, in our ethical standards is really a guideline of how we're supposed to um, treat in our responsibilities to students and families. So it doesn't outline um, a level of procedures, but there are expectations that we are doing what we can to make students comfortable. So one student may have a concern about locker rooms where another student may have concerns about bathrooms. So we handle those more on a case by case spaces. Um, what I find, especially when we have professional learning opportunities for school counselors like we had this past August, um, and we talked about um, gender identity and its role in our school counseling program, um, we had an opportunity to kind of talk about what are some of the things that each one of the elementary or secondary schools doing and giving each person kind of ideas. And as we're hearing, um, what are some of the concerns? Those are then things that I can then bring to my leadership to 
to say, um, here are some concerns, here are some um, steps or things that we may put in place. Um, it's kind of hard to say, like, here's a set of expectations. Like when we have a suicide ideation, there are steps that we have to follow. In a case when a student identifies, we're taking the lead of the student and family. And sometimes those two are at odds. And so we're, we're kind of treading lightly. Okay, because one thing that I'm imagining is being an, a, a trans student who is coming out with a family who is unaccepting of that. Um, and I mean, this is hypothetical. And I, I'm in a classroom, and I, I, you know, I don't there. I don't know what the process is. I don't know who to go to about this. There's nothing online that I can find that explains what I can do, what I, who, what kind of what kind of rights I have, anything like that. There is no document. There's no infographic that explains. Talk to your counselor, and then your counselor, or administrator, teachers. There's there's nothing that students have to explain what what the process is like unless they go to that counselor and make that first step. But there are times when students don't have the relationship with their counselor to say that. There are times when their 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 family is so unaccepting that their family isn't advocating for that as well. And so those students are not going to be the ones to you know advocate for themselves necessarily always. So I I think we definitely need some sort of like documentation steps that a student should take if if you're beginning if you're transitioning it if you're if your gender identity if you're if you're coming up for gender identity you know what things that you can do to make sure that you have accommodations to ensure that you have you know the the respect of, of your peers and, and your teachers and that kind of stuff because it's such a scary process and I didn't have to go through that of being a transgender but even coming out as gay in my school community and, and in my family it's such a such a hard process so I, I I really think we have work to do when it comes to the procedures that students can have and having access to documents to things they can look at to see exactly what it is that is present for us right now. So thank you for that, Mr. Thomas. Maybe that's something you could email over um, some suggestions to staff so that we could maybe um, um, sort of start creating those kinds of things. Um, yes. Yeah, definitely. So I want to make sure. Oh, sorry, Steps. Do you have any response back to what Mr. Thomas uh, and Ms. Scott, um, just to just kind of follow up, um, you know, as Ms. Ferguson said that we do have a work group um, that was um, recently reactivated and, um, you know, as a result, um, a lot of these topics, um, especially trying to have that student voice because I don't want to um, speak for any student um, and not give them an opportunity to say what they need from their own perspective, especially um, because things look very different. And so as a result um, of that, we do have um, an opportunity for us to um, discuss courageous conversations, um, have curriculum considerations, not just for school counseling and school counseling curriculum, um, but looking at different books and support that we recommend to parents, um, facilities, professional learning, the uh, LGBTQ plus manual, um, and as well as developing a website presence. And so I think um, just kind of thinking about um, Mr. Thomas, just looking at that possible web presence to kind of say, here are, you know, here's a place where the document can live, but then here are also some supports um, and where you can utilize your school um, support personnel to begin to help you along that journey to make that a little bit easier. But I think um, none of this would happen without student voice. And that's where um, with the school counselors that have identified whether they have a GSA or not, um, you know, we'll definitely have a conversation about why their school may not and, and look to potentially um, have a much more um, active participation because even for whatever reason that they may not have it, I also don't want students to imply that um, there is not a lack, a, a level of care um, or concern about the issues of students because they don't see one and note that their school next door has one. So we absolutely um, will begin to address some of those issues. All right, thank you for that. Ms. You. And it looks like um, Dr. Hager um, has a question. Or comment, rather. Dr. Hager, are you there? For the presentation, and um, I just really. Can you guys hear me? Sorry, we, uh, yes, we couldn't hear you. It looks like you're on, you were on mute. OK, can you hear me now? Certainly, I can hear you now. <laughs> oh, you can, okay. Sorry, I was like, what's happening? Um, okay, so I wanted to um, to really echo some of the things that, that Mr. Thomas was saying about 
GSAs and um, they have the data. Sorry, could you? Oh, I'm glitching. Darn it. Sorry, Dr. Hager, I wasn't sure if it was just me. <laughs> can everyone hear me okay? <laughs> yes, I, can hear you. I can hear you. Yes. Okay. okay. Okay, try again, Dr. Hager. Let's see. Okay, I turned my camera off to see if that helps. No? I think, I think that helps. Oh, it does. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, sorry. Um, I've had no problem all day. This is my, I think, eighth Zoom call. So. <laughs> I just wanted to um, mention the wire data that's available online does provide county specific data and it has a report on risk behaviors and sexual identity. And that's the link that I put in the chat and just highlighting some of the comments that Mr. Thomas made about the GSAs in schools and um, for instance, which is gay, lesbian or bisexual, which is used in the report. Um, are at such high risk for risk behaviors. And these are so priority for us to protect these kids um, and hopefully prevent other risk behaviors. These are approved by TABCO as a club that, um, you know, teachers are compensated for. So, um, so I guess it would be put into place to kind of make this a priority. I, I heard um, it was said that, you know, that we will move forward with this, but is there someone at the central office level who sees this already or should be overseeing this or, or kind of what are the specific steps we need to take to all of our schools? Sorry, Dr. Hager, you were going in and out. Um, I'll rephrase if I can. It sounds like what you said is that there are clubs and 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 that it's different at, at different schools and and is there someone at the central office that oversees i guess the implementation of the clubs at um the various schools that was a, a very that was a summation um so yeah yes okay great <laughs> great yeah if staff can answer that that would be awesome so the question is, is there someone at the central office level that supports the GSA clubs? That's what it sounded like she was asking. Yes. Oh, OK, yes, yes. So um, certainly um, that support will come out of the um, Office of Student Support Services. OK, and, and so I guess it sounded like she was also asking you, Mr. Thomas, put that in. What can we do, I guess, sort of to ensure that that's happening? to ensure that the support is there or to ensure that there is a club at every school? Probably all of the above. I would say both. Certainly we can make the schools aware of the um, the GSA um, opportunity, the EDA opportunity out there. Um, so we can uh, certainly put that information out and then offer support moving forward. OK, and support as far as maybe um, if That's there is a Sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, sometimes the support, and we have received questions. Um, some of our GSA leaders at schools will ask us about resources um, that they can share with students. They will ask us, you know, they will ask questions that are in our uh, manual that they may or may not have seen. So we, we have received questions and we do respond to them once we receive them. Okay, and I guess I would also ask, um, if you know I'm a transgender student, I'm at school and I don't know how to start a club. Do we put signs up or or information out so that um, students can be prompted perhaps to start those support groups or clubs? Yeah, I think that was kind of when when Miss Romini was talking about the need for more of a web presence um, as well as um, public facing documents. That's something that we're working on in our current work group uh, so that we're you know that information is more visible. Um, and as Mr. Thomas had to, he doesn't have to go to his administrator to get a copy of a manual. Um, we want to make sure that um, information is out there for all students. Okay. So that's something that we're working on. And Dr. Hager, oh, sorry, um, Mr. Handy has a comment, but I'll ask Dr. Hager's question if that's okay. Um, since she was glitching, she said, can you name the Student Support Services Office 
uh, individual or person who, um, who, I guess, who would be at central office? Yeah, so I'm right now we have a vacancy in the director of student support services. So um, because that office is under my umbrella, I would be the contact for that, Kim Ferguson. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Handy. Thank you, Ms. Scott. I just wanted to add to the topic of the GSA and support. So uh, we'll be convening meetings with equity liaisons, uh, the Department of Equity and Cultural Proficiency. We have some meetings coming up. Each school has identified at least one equity liaison. When we meet with them um, in early March, we can also um, encourage them and check to see who does have a GSA and make sure we get lend some support in that manner. And um, also, in working with Ms. Ferguson and Ms. Ramin, um, I'm a member of their work group along with a specialist from my department. So um, I just wanted to make clear that is um, a priority for the Department of Equity and Cultural Proficiency as well to um, support our LGBTQ plus students um, and staff. Oh, great. Thank you for that. You're All right. Um, and it looks like, oh, you have additional questions, Mr. Thomas. So we are limited on time, but yes. Um, I'm sure we can take uh, one or two more questions before we move on. OK, one or two more. Um, OK, uh, so one of the things in the manual and was referenced on the, on the PowerPoint is that students can change their gender expression or their pronouns and their names on the student information system, um, but it requires parent approval. So what if you have a, a, a family that is not supporting of, of the gender identity of a student and, and their pronouns? Are they unable to have their their name uh, changed on on the official server? So does that mean, for example, in virtual learning, that they would have to log in with Google Meets with names that are not corresponding to their um, gender identity? So students are not able to use the um, preferred option in the SIS if they do not have parent permission. Um, that is something that we went um, over quite a bit. Um, and we'll certainly bring it to the forefront for this new um, revision to the manual um, because we are a school system and um, students have to be over the age of 18 to make changes to their um, identity officially. Um, that is where we landed with that decision. Um, before we were, um, before the option for the SIS was in place, we certainly teachers were um, making sure that students' names were corrected on their um, on their classroom rosters, um, and all of that was in place at the school level. Um, that option is still there. Um, it is not the perfect option for students, um, but because we are um, compelled to communicate to families um, any changes in a student's identity, um, that it's required if a kid is under 18. Um, if the kid is over 18 or student is over 18, then parent permission is not required. Um, that when in the when this preferred name or the preferred um, gender is updated in the SIS, that information goes home. Um, and and if, when a student's um, to the parents and students of, and so that name will be on that that letterhead on that label. Um, we want parents to know what they should what they will be receiving when it comes in the mail. Um, so that's why that communication is necessary. Um, and we do encourage and it is in the manual that um, in those in those instances that we have a we most of the time the school council will encourage the student to have conversations with their family if they can bring everybody in um, because you know as Ms. Marine Ms. Ramin said um, this has a huge impact on students. Um, and we want students to feel comfortable in the in the space in school. So we want to make sure that um, students get that opportunity to use that preferred name option. Unfortunately, we're bound right now because kids are under the age of 18. We cannot make changes to their identity without parent permission. OK, um, chapter six implementation of this manual um, on page 13 it says the system shall conduct staff training for all staff members about their responsibilities under applicable laws in this manual including teachers administrators counselors social workers and health staff um, I, you provided some examples on the powerpoint of specific trainings that occur um, i'm wondering are there any kind of 
how that training occurs once, yes, but then how are or how is that training consistently being implemented? Are there other training? Are there other discussions about gender identity? And I mean, what if a teacher is refute? How do teachers know how, when, and how to address a student respectfully with their pronouns? So we do provide training to our student port, student support personnel on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. um, that training then, so those personnel work in schools. Um, they would get that information from the student support personnel that we tra we train. We don't provide train. At my office doesn't train the teachers um, in this information. Certainly, there should be. You know, we we agree that there should be some systemic training. We just are have not gotten to that place. We have trained the people that are under the student support personnel umbrella, and we also have shared this information with administrators. Certainly, it's time to provide more updated training um, because, as I said, the last time. This uh, manual was developed. It was in 2018, and we're, you know, quite four years later. So it's time to update the manual and provide more training, and then also be a bit more public facing with the information, so that people won't have to, you know, right now they just contact me directly if they have questions. Um, but having a website presence would eliminate some of those questions because the information would be right there. Um, but I, I agree that we do need to open up this training to more staff members. Um, but in the past, what we have done is at least touch the administrators and the student student support personnel in schools. Thank you, because I had an experience this year um, and last year where my best friend is transgender and he was consistently not being addressed by the correct pronouns. And even after correcting the teacher, that was consistently still not being addressed by the correct pronouns. And at first I, I assumed it was accidental, but then it seemed to be not always accidental. And this document defines harassment as not respecting pronouns. So I, I just, I think that training is very important and I agree that it should be systemic. Ms. Scott, I do have one more question. I know we're short on time. Would I be able to ask this last question, please? Yes, sure, go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, so in this document, it also explains it, it discusses that you know students should be what will be allowed or are strongly recommended to it is strongly recommended that all transgender and gender nonconforming student athletes be allowed to play on sports teams based on their self-identified gender. What does this mean by strongly recommended? It doesn't say mandated. So uh, it, it, it's concerning because then what if there is a coach or or, or a teacher that or or an administration that does not allow that student to do that because uh, it's strongly recommended, not, not a mandate. Um, are there systems in place to ensure that they are allowed to? And um, and yeah, I guess I guess that's my question. And and it also says something about a a uh, appeals review panel or, or in this document for for a student to participate in in a gender a sport that has their that they have to participate with their gender identity. You know, um, what how does that group work that the uh, appeals uh, panel group. Well, so um, I, I know Mr. Sai is on the call. Mr. Sai, do you want to um, respond to that question? <clears throat> yes, so um, I appreciate the question. So as you stated regarding the, the manual, uh, there is a procedure in place. So again, we just want to make sure that all entities know what is going on as it relates to the student participating on the interscholastic athletic team. There should be no reason why they shouldn't, but at the same time, we do need parent permission. I think uh, Ms. Ferguson was discussing it earlier regarding uh, the student uh, and permission. We need permission for them to, to participate on the teams in, in your, your general normal stance, and then we want to just make sure that we have the same permission from parents. The last thing we want to have is for a parent not to be brought into the loop as it pertains to their kid and their gender identity and participating on a particular, uh, a particular program. So again, uh, as you noted in the procedure, um, we pulled together an appeals committee that is a group of individuals that are at the local school, including and or not to be limited to uh, a physician, a school psychologist, a licensed mental health professional, uh, myself, school administrator, athletic director, and the coach to have a conversation with the kid and the parent to make sure that we're all on the same page as it relates to that. And once we come to the conclusion that we are all on the same page as it relates to it, then we will allow that kid to participate in the sport that they identify as. And in this, once we do this at this meeting, we don't have to go back and do this for every single season. So whether this kid comes out in the fall and this happens and we go through this process, 
we will have to go back in the winter if they play a different sport or in the spring because we've already gone through the process early in, in the season of the year. And that would happen at any point in the year. And then that would be locked in for the remainder of that season uh, in case that there's a situation where the next year the, the kid changes. But for that particular, we just want to make sure that we are all on the same page as it relates to that kid and the participation on that particular team. Thank you for sharing that. And going back to the publicly accessible and web presence. I think that's so important with this because when I was visiting a school when I alluded to this during one of my small reports, I had said that there was a student who was super passionate about athletics, a trans student who was passionate about athletics, wanted to be involved in athletics, but didn't feel comfortable in their home school participating in athletics. And so they went to a magnet school for that matter. And even now, I don't I don't believe they're participating in athletics just because that they they'd have they maybe they were interested in 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 participating in a, in a gender segregated sport um and, and not knowing how they would be able to participate in that sport if they're gender non-conforming so thank you for that um and I, i'm excited to to see the what comes from this meeting and, and i'm excited to see the the uh public facing document related to the lgbt plus manual so thank you all so much for taking the time to be here and and, and speaking on this matter yes thank you for that Mr. Thomas for, for bringing that in. And thank you all so much for speaking to that. Um, and we can go now to our next presentation, which is career and technical education, the five-year plan. And that's presented by Dr. Mary McComas, Dr. Jeffrey Holmes, Ms. Megan Shea, Ms. Sherry Fisher, and Dr. Michael Grubbs. Good afternoon, committee members. Mr. Thomas has his hand up, so I'm going to wait. Thank you. Ms. Scott, um, would it be appropriate to excuse the, um, the previous presenters? So that's um, Mr. Handy's uh, or, um, job, and so I'm not <laughs> sure if they're going to be presenting again, um, but if they're finished, they're more than welcome to be excused, but um, I believe that's something that um, Mr. Handy would handle, but thank you for bringing that up. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Ms. Scott, and thank you, Mr. Thomas, for the reminder. So I want to thank our presenters for our first topic and um, excuse you all at this time while we transition to CTE. Thank you all. Thank you. Especially thank you. when it's so nice and warm out. That's very generous to, to, to let them go. Thank you. So good afternoon, committee members. Um, thank you so much for having us here today. Um, I am joined today as, um, by Ms. Sherry Fisher, the director of CTE and Fine Arts, and Dr. Michael Grubbs, the coordinator. Um, we are here very excited to share with you um, the work that we continue to do um, with CTE um, and our next five-year plan, specifically looking at equity and access. Um, as you all know, we have a wonderful predecessor, Mr. Handy, who began much of this work and who is still very much a part of this work. Um, so much of what we do regarding program placement um, in the last five years, and we hope is reflected in what you'll see this evening, has been about ensuring equity of access and opportunity for our students. Um, what we hope to explain tonight is that not only is it about program placement, um, but it's also about program quality and some of the ways that we've been working to ensure that our programs are of the highest quality and so that all of our students are prepared for a college and career of their choice based on the skills and opportunities they have through our programs. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Fisher and Dr. Grubbs. Thank you, Megan. I think, Mike, we can go to the next slide. So um, as uh, Megan alluded to, one of the things is, you know, we're, what we're looking at right now is we've just completed our first five year plan in CTE. And so some background around this is uh, this really that CTE is really continuing to grow. And really, this is a result of leadership in BCPS, um, the work of my predecessor and actually Mike's predecessor at one point, um, Doug Handy, uh, that really um, brought a lot of this to BCPS and then high expectations in the Acad Office of Academics and then really reducing access inequalities in our CTE programs and increased attention around CTE that's coming both uh, at the state but also federal level and through our business partners. And really we've been looking at kind of three things that have really been, um, we started really with program location, looking at the NAEP pipe process, which is the National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity, and then also now really shifting towards the quality of our programs. And we're going to look at the growth and expansion since 2016, describe sort of the results, and then really where we're going with phase two.
You can go to the next slide, Mike. I think it's delayed okay. a bit, Sherry. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think it's delayed. Yeah. OK. Um, so uh, so where we are today, so BCPS is really in a great place in, in representation in terms of the state of Maryland. We've increased from 11,000 students in 2014 to um, to more than uh, the 17,382 today. And really what we're seeing is a huge increase in terms of our internships each year. Uh, the number of students participating in CTE is over 51.5% and we have nearly 40 programs of study. And so here we have two students. We have Haley Brennan and uh, Devante that, um, over on the right. And we have two students that are really represent sort of uh, one of the things that we really work with, you know, in terms of CT is helping students find their passion and connecting them to careers that go in many different directions and really those opportunities that launch their futures. So in looking at reflecting on uh, phase one, this was 2016 to 2020. What you see here in the on the graph is the sort of the representation of our students enrollment by cluster. And one of the things that we're really proud of is how reflective this is in terms of if you were to look at the Department of Labor data and look at the Baltimore metro region, it would be really comparable in terms of sort of you'd see a lot of uh, industry growth in IT, in business management, and you see that reflected in where our students are as well. Um, and so, you know, when we look at what we're doing, we've looked at sort of the career clusters and we've made sure we're looking to really make sure we have even representation in each of the three BCPS zones to make sure we have at least throw three programs of study in each high school and then really to reduce and expand those offerings to ensure that we've got, you know, strong implementation and, you know, and really meeting the needs both of the communities where our schools are located, but also in the interests of our students and really kind of looking at that kind of that mix of those pieces as we look at what's in a school and really what works well there. We are constantly reviewing and adjusting that kind of information. So we've added a few programs recently. Aviation Technology is at Kenwood High School, as well as um, we have that at Hereford, but we're also looking to add that to Lansdowne, looking at sort of some of the, you know, some of the connections we have, especially with Lansdowne close proximity to BWI. Uh, Kenwood in its proximity to Martins. So some of those pieces, the addition of a, um, artificial intelligence and um, and so really looking at some of those pieces. Another example is sometimes this means shifting programs. So we used to have a program called drafting. It's a very specific skill set. Instead of identifying one skill set, expanding that into construction design management, which is um, can be draft includes drafting, but goes even further than that and can it go into architecture um, or into some more specific kinds of pieces of building. And so there you can you can really broaden students that might have interest in that program and really, you know what it can how it can kind of be shaped at an individual school. Another example is ProStart. This upgraded a locally developed food nutrition sciences program in BCPS and now provides an industry recognized credential in all of our schools that are offering ProStart. Um, I've had the pleasure to visit a lot of ProStart programs this year, and um, it's really incredible to see the students getting this skill set and really um, leaving with, you know, really a great credential that they may use directly to go into an industry or to support other aspects of their lives as they go forward. I think I'm going to turn it over to Mike at this one. Thanks. Thank you, Sherry. Um, so just you know, Sherry alluded to some of the first um, the first phase of our five year plan. Um, this is the result of our cluster representation in each of our three zones. And so if you would have looked at this figure three, five, seven years ago, you would have seen a lot more red. You would have seen a lot more clusters that were not represented in the west, the central or the east zone. Um, I am pleased to share that as a result of the work we've been engaged in the last five years, is that we only have one cluster that's not represented in a specific zone. And to be honest with you, we have a lot of plans, we have ideas, we're looking at that east zone for the environmental, agricultural, and natural resources cluster. We're also looking at the good fit, at a good fit. That field and that cluster is also changing. Um, we do have uh, the ag program at Hereford High School and we have the environmental technology at Western Tech, but that field is changing. And so before we jump into a launching a new program in the east zone, 
we're looking at things like vertical farming. We're looking at things like um, the future of robotics and unmanned systems for farming and industry and urban agriculture. Uh, so we do have some ideas in place. We are looking at the East Zone for um, the Environmental Agricultural Natural Resources Cluster. Uh, we are pleased to share that at this point, every cluster, regardless of zip code, students have access to every single cluster. Um, and that's work that we're continuing to investigate. So on the next slide, this is just a little bit of a summary of the breakdown per zone at the program level. Um, we get a lot of questions about different zones, number of programs, who has the most. Um, we are pleased to share that the West is actually averaging out to have the most CT programs to study per school. They have seven schools, so they have two less schools than the other zones. Um, and they're doing really well. We've actually saturated the West zone as much as we can in the past few years. The central zone has about 54 programs of study and the east zone has 74 programs of study right now. This is our most recent map. Um, it's super hard to see. Um, we will be emailing it out. We have a few updates to provide. Uh, we've actually updated these maps as a result of our Board of Education presentation in um, November. Um, so we will email this out to board members. We have one program we have to add uh, that we just sent for update. Um, and this is another example of something that we'll be sharing. Um, really hard to see. We just wanted to give you kind of a quick visualization of how we plan. Obviously, it wasn't uh, expectations to look at every single letter and program a study, um, but this is how we plan our programs. The reds are program expansions. Um, so Ms. Fisher talked about artificial intelligence. That's in red in the far right column. And that's how we look across the school system on a weekly, monthly, yearly basis for how our programs are located. And we pivot to make sure that our programs are, um, are expanded upon. And, and again, it wasn't to share to look at every single program. It was just a visualization. Uh, we will make sure that you get copies of these documents at the, uh, the end of our presentation. Um, one thing I just want to point out is we're offering 40 programs of study, 40 different types of options across BCPS. And those 40 different pathways and options make up over 220 programs of study in BCPS. Um, out of a little office of eight people, that's a lot of program management. And I do just want to echo, we feel very supported um, by the leadership in BCPS. So Sherry, I think you're on the next one. Yes, so as we now look at phase two and really, you know, a really a successful phase one, now what we're really shifting towards is, you know, really to continue to look at our growth and expansion, but really look at this through the lens of blueprint and how does that kind of impact it? And a lot of that is going to be ensure that we have really quality program implementation. And one of the, the ways we're really looking at that is really in terms of four ways the monitoring the implementation in our schools, what are new expansion opportunities as technology changes as we look at the landscape of schools? You know, what are some of those things? Looking at our magnet program review, kind of identifying some growth there. And then really this last piece is coming out of this work, an increased need um, for school based support and what that could look like. So really looking at, you know, thinking in terms of really improving equity and access, we're thinking a lot about of focus and we're going to share some data um, some new data that we are now receiving from the state that helps us really zero in on that who is participating but also who is completing in CTE programs um, and really the and you know and, and I mentioned sort of looking at that variability that we have between sort of our magnet and comprehensive programs um, so I think we can go to the next slide with those pieces yeah so um, so here's a few examples of how phase two we're looking at quality of implementation as Ms. Shea talked about we're looking at are the approved programs that are being offered at the school, are they being implemented in, with fidelity? Um, what does the scheduling and sequencing look like? How are we recruiting students in? How are we counseling them? What conversations are we having? From an equity and access standpoint, are we just placing students in certain programs? Or are we having deep conversations on their career plans? Um, what does enrollment and instructional practice look like? And then more importantly, uh, with Blueprint for Maryland is that credential piece. Are students leaving high school with an industry recognized credential and that value added component that they can take on whatever pathway they pursue, whether it's college, higher education or the trades. One of the challenges that we face with NCT is the example on the right of program implementation. This is an example of a high school where the programs that are listed 
are all the programs that are approved by MSD, MSDE to be offered at the school. The challenges that we sometimes face is whether they schedule, whether they fully implement the program of study. And so the ones in green are being fully implemented. The ones in red, unfortunately, at this school, their scheduling or teacher or staffing challenges are not being implemented, although they're approved and we've planned for this program to be at the school. So through constant conversations and follow up, we do, you know, we check in, we have conversations with the principals, we work with the school based leaders, um, but it is a challenge to make sure that the program is being fully implemented. The one is yellow is just an example of a recently added program. Uh, they're in year two, uh, but they're going to be offering the the final course um, next school year. So uh, that's one of the challenges that we face is just that constant monitoring to make sure that the, the program is being implemented with fidelity. So um, expansion opportunities, um, I think, am I, yes, I'm covering this one as well. So these are expansion plans that are currently in progress. Uh, Teacher Academy of Maryland, you know, we know we have a teaching shortage, finding and recru recruiting and retaining teachers, not just any teachers, but um, teachers of color and making sure that we have representation of our students um, population uh, really prompted us to make sure that we focus on this grow your own initiative. So we are expanding TAM across the school system. We're doing it in phases to make sure that as we uh, bring four to five new schools on, they're implementing it, we're working out kinks, and then we bring on a next batch of Teacher Academy of Maryland programs. Aviation technology, as Ms. Fisher said, uh, we're expanding to the West Zone due to proximity to BWI um, and making sure that we have an aviation technology program in the West Zone. Um, Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness is another program we're looking to add to Lansdowne High School um, to give those students an additional opportunity. Aviation and Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness is also um, an opportunity to think beyond that community only having the trades, only having carpentry, only having electrical. Important fields, but also there's a whole nother realm of pathways for those students beyond just putting them into the trades. And so we were very tactful in adding these programs so that they have additional opportunities. The programs on the right are programs that we're considering, but a lot of these decisions have to do with facility and finding the teacher and just making sure that again, the staffing will, will be a good fit. We're always looking for opportunities to add automotive in the central area, for example, um, looking at opportunities to add building construction and technology in the central area. Those clusters are represented, but maybe not that exact program of study. Um, electrical is only at Lansdowne High School, so we're looking at the central and the east zone to expand that program. Same with plumbing, it's in the east and the west. We don't have anywhere in the central area to add. Engineering careers, it is at Eastern Tech, but it's not in the central or the west zone. I love that chair. Um, but we are looking for cheers from our other members of, of the community in the West and the Central Zone. Um, in Diesel, it's only at Sellers Point Technical High School. Uh, we are looking for this, uh, the West and the Central Zone. And Graphic and Print is not in the Central Zone as well. But we are excited to share that hopefully there will be a Northwest Shared Time Center. Currently, Sellers Point Technical, uh, Sellers Point Tech, I'm getting so excited about those cheers, it, it, it's distracting me. Um, I love it. But um, so uh, Sellers Point is our only shared time center in BCPS. So students go to their home school half the day and they go to shared to the Sellers Point shared time center the other half of the day. We are looking to expand that in the Northwest uh, region, which could really help solidify some of these programs because that's the opportunity to build it into the new school specs, find the teacher and do some of that early planning now. So. Uh, I think, Sherry, you're going to talk about the alignment where we currently stand. Hope you're on mute, Sherry. One of the things we've been working to do is uh, to really look at sort of the alignment in our magnet programs so that when we have um, magnet programs, they are different from programs that we have in our comprehensive schools and making sure that we have really um, incredible, excellent programs in both spaces. And so what you see here is 28 programs that are really largely resolved. And this would look very different five years ago, three years ago, um, 20 years ago. Um, so, you know, so it really is a big difference in terms of these. So these are 28 things that have been resolved during phase one in terms of, you know, where programs are located and how they are designed in terms of a curricular representation. 
if I can, Sherry, I just want to add part of the reason that was a focus of this team is around our work for equity, because when you have programs that are overlapping with magnet and comprehensive, you could have two students in sitting side by side in a program of study and they got there very differently in terms of the requirements. And so I just wanted to make that connection because of the goals of this particular committee. Part of our goal around separating these programs is for that clarity and equity of access and opportunity um, so that students who apply for a magnet program and have one criteria for how they're being admitted, which I know is a big topic for this committee last month, um, that needs to be distinctly separate from those programs that are offered at our comprehensive high schools so that students are not side by side in a classroom with very different expectations for how they got there. Back to you, Sherry. Sorry, I just wanted to draw that connecting <laughs> for this committee. Thank you. Right. I think we can go to the next slide. Next slide. Mm -hmm. um, so we're um, as part of our uh, phase two five year plan. Um, we're actually in step two of that process. We have multiple steps laid out. We've been working on for about the past year and a half. Um, step two is what we call our easier fixes. There, it's not a big disruption in the current practices or the programming at the school level. It might only involve one or two schools. Uh, not a lot of disruption. One example is graphic print communications. Right now it's at Kenwood and it's at Western Tech, two phenomenal programs. Uh, There's a whole press release yesterday about both programs uh, for CT month. Um, but the difference is same curriculum, same experience. One's magnet, one's not. One, one keeps kids out, one lets them all in. One has more funding, one has less funding. And so what we're engaging in is that we're going to either pull one out of magnet or move one to magnet or move the location of one from the community, one community to another community. When those things happen, we do engage with the principal and we look at replacement programs. But I just want to highlight one example that we're starting to focus on. We're just starting those conversations. This is kind of the beginning of that process. And there's some other examples. Interactive media production. It's at Eastern and Carver, so it's a magnet program. Um, but then in other schools, it's a, it's it's a, in comprehensive high schools. And it's the exact same curriculum, same experience, and that's an inequity in the school system. Um, we're also looking at the conversion of our digital arts programs to IMP to get that value added piece, to get those Perkins alignment, and to leave with some um, value added credentials. Um, I'm not going to talk through all of them, but there's other examples such as carpentry uh, careers. Um, it's at Carver and Lansdowne, which is a magnet program, but then it's at Perry Hall, Owings, Mills, and Kenwood, and those are non-magnets. Again, same curriculum, same experiences, but barriers for one compared to less barriers for the other. So um, that is our step two that we're working on right now. Those are conversations with the principal, with the magnet office, and we're just kicking that off um, very recently. Step three are ones that are a little bit more, um, a little bit more collaborative. Um, Sollers Point has Project Lead the Way Biomedical. It is a, a very successful program. It's at a shared time center, but everywhere else at our other seven schools, it is non-magnet. Um, so that's a deeper discussion. It's a successful program. It's the only, it's at a shared time, so it's technically not at a high school. It's at our um, half-day program, and that's one that's going to take a little bit more of deeper discussion. Project Lead the Way Engineering is another one. Um, Woodlawn, Parkville, Chesapeake High School. So three out of the eight Project Lead the Way Engineering programs, almost half are magnet. The other ones are not magnet. So it's a little bit more of a disruption. And we also have been very successful with our Woodlawn program. We've been able to pull a few students across boundaries. The students are completing the program of study. So it's just going to take a little bit more effort to research and, and unpack. Uh, mechanical construction and plumbing engineers is another one uh, that we need to explore as well. And then step four is our whole school magnets. So that's going to take a little bit more of a deeper dive to disrupt some of those things. Chesapeake and Lansdowne High School, all of their programs um, are tech could be technically uh, magnet. Um, and that's just that's going to take a little bit different of disruption. And then Teacher Academy of Maryland, as I mentioned, we're expanding it everywhere. But at the same time, it's at Eastern Tech and it's at Parkville High School. And we don't necessarily want to pull it out of that community either because it has been very successful, particularly at Eastern Tech. It's been a storied program there highlighted at MSDE. So um, not, not a discussion that I want to start anytime soon myself, to be honest with you. So, um, but it is something we have to, we have to disrupt, we have to look at. So 
Um, I think the next one I think is on me as well. This is we're going to get a little bit deeper into our equity and CTE. Um, some of our more specific initiatives. So in terms of equality and equity, um, JA Inspire is one that we have been very collaborative on with school counseling, the Office of Social Studies, the Transportation Office. And really what prompted some of that was we don't have consistent programming at the middle school level. And so if you're not familiar with JA Inspire, we've been able to um, take all grade eight students and give them some career exploration resources either off site or uh, in a virtual environment to connect with business partners and learn more about really um, options for their career pathways, either at the high school level or after high school. Um, we've been able to impact 8,000 eighth graders every single year for the last four years. Um, and if you haven't attended that event, we'd love to share some more resourcing and it's November of every year um, and uh, we'll definitely keep you updated. Uh, we've also enacted a CT comp summer camp. Um, it was free for students last year, no cost. It was virtual. I think we had about 170 rising grade eight students. It was a week long event um, and they learned more about CTE. They learned about different pathways, different programs of study. And again, it was really just to inform students so that they can make better decisions at the high school level for what programs may interest them. Um, we did something really unique last year with it. We asked them to pick their top five career clusters. Um, we gave them four of those and we gave them one that they did not pick to expose them to something different. And that was really feedback from Doug Handy um, to make sure that we really just uh, really gave students an alternative to what they thought were their passions and maybe one that they did not know anything about. And that was highly successful. Students actually said they're really glad that we exposed them to something that they didn't think would interest them. We are also in our fourth year of our NAPE pipe equity cohort, and I'm going to unpack that a little bit further. But what we've begun doing is that this figure we've we've exposed to our teachers numerous times, and we tend to get general answers back, right? Very shallow, not in depth. You know, what's the difference between equity and equality? What we've been doing very differently, we've been asking them to call out the game from a CT perspective. You know, what's the game that we're playing, right? Is it access to a program? Is it completing the program? Is it, you know, and, and it's it's been, we've been engaging our cohort much differently. And then we've been asking them, what are the boxes in your in your day to day? Call out the boxes in the picture. Um, and so instead of just asking them to define equity and define equality and moving on, We've been asking them to really call out what those boxes are. What's the different game? You know, we're not talking baseball. So when we're talking CT, what are those examples? Um, and I'm going to unpack that work a little bit on the next few slides. Um, and then our Perkins 5 plan, that really calls out making sure that we're disrupting uh, student data by gender, race, and special populations. And so Sherry is going to talk a little about that on some upcoming slides or how we look down to the student program and cluster level to disrupt some of that work. Um, Sherry, I think you're going to talk about Perkins a little bit. It came up. I clicked it, but it's probably still loading. Okay. So um, yeah, so as we're looking at this, um, again, this is an example of some of the data we are now receiving from the state. And I'll give you a little bit of what you're looking at here um, and not an intention to go in and look at each of these pieces. But the bar graph on the right, what you can see is our student enrollment in um, comparison to our district enrollment. And you see it looks very similar. And that is a huge um, amount of work and credit to um, my predecessors and the work of the CTE office um, and really to make sure that we have incredible access for our students as we look across different demographics. Um, and so I think it really speaks to looking at that first uh, five year plan and its successes. Now, the kind of data we're receiving now um, is really very, it's very specific. And what you're seeing here is sort of this, um, this orange and blue, this sort of represents sort of overrepresentation or underrepresentation by specific programs at this point and in terms of not only race and gender but also other special populations so we can really look and target our work very um, in a very detailed way to then even get you know to really look at where um, how we use this to decide on funding Perkins the in terms of how we identify 
uh, the types of supports that are needed and that we use for that grant funding process. So this is a big part of our sort of needs assessment process that goes into preparing that grant um, for review and um, ultimately for implementation. So this is work that everyone in the CTE office is diving into right now. Mike and I had training on it last week. And so really this is the kind of work that our supervisors are doing with resource teachers. Um, and it is really intensive and important work because if we want to see things change, we have to get to this level where the students are and actually start to make significant changes uh, so that our students are better represented in our programs. And I'll, and I'll be honest, as we looked at this across the state, we had some, we, you know, we were, we're in a really good place in Baltimore County, but there is still, when we get down to that program level, work to do. And a lot of that is going to be, you know, really working more closely with our school communities around understanding the needs and barriers and what, you know, what are those boxes for an individual school and how can we adjust some of the, the things that are going into them? How, what barriers can we remove? Thank you, Sherry. So um, I should have known better than say the acronym, so I appreciate Ms. Shea dropping in the chat. Um, so when I said NAEP, that's the National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity. Uh, and then PIPE is our program improvement process for equity. And so we've been doing this for four years and it really ties into the data that Sherry just um, was just discussing because we take that data, we work with teachers and then we build capacity. We don't give them the answers. Um, we really talk about how do you disrupt the work at your school. Look at your data, look at, look at gender, look at race, look at special populations. And so these are the examples that we take through every single year. Um, we work with about 10 to 20 teachers, school counselors, department chairs um, each year, and we have them really again look at their data. Start with the data. Um, this is an example from Sollers Point Technical High School. This was from about two years ago. They focused on special populations. So this is their baseline data. 5% or 19 special education students in career and technical education programs to study. That is a very low percentage participating in CT at Sellers Point at the time. Their SMART goal was to increase special education enrollment in CTE from the current 5% to 10% by the next school year. And so that's where the teachers start. We meet four times throughout the year and then they move into fishbone diagramming. They think about the root cause. Why is that happening? Is it education? Is it family? Is it careers? Is it internal? Is it self-efficacy? But it's up to them to just speak their truth. They just throw out why that problem is happening. Because what we showcase to them is we don't want them solving with a strategy that's not really going to solve the problem. You know, an example is you may think that this child does not want to do it because their friends do not want to do it. Well, if you invite their friends in the class and that wasn't the answer, you provided a solution that was really never the problem to begin with. Um, or hang up mo more posters. Well, maybe the students saw the posters, but they just don't have the career awareness piece. So the next thing that we take our teachers through is the discovery phase. They take that fishbone diagram, they take their reasons that they think that that uh, inequity is, is, is happening, and they form a hypothesis. These are two real examples that we've done in the past. In this hypothesis, our teachers believe that black female students were not participating in Project Lead to Engineering because their friends did not express interest. Then they test that hypothesis. So this teacher created a 10 question survey. They deployed it to 50 students and the results came back. 95% of black female students for this school confirmed that they did not pursue PLTW Engineering because their friends didn't take the task, the, the class. And the other example, we believe that white males are not participating in cosmetology because their parents have influenced their decision. They created a focus group with 10 students. They asked them questions. They in, uh, interviewed them and 10 percent of white males, white males responded. Their parents influenced their decision. So that was a very different strategy than if they thought that it was um, something else, marketing or flyers or posters. Um, and then they um, these are just some examples of success. Uh, so we had a P-TECH program at Dundalk High School and they are focused on increasing female students, particularly students of color enrolling in the P-TECH program. So just some quick data. Um, these are real students. This really happened. This is real improvement. 
Uh, we took female student enrollment from 31% to 40%. And this was in a semester. This wasn't a year, this wasn't two years. This is a really quick turnaround. Um, female students of color enrollment went from 10.5% to 20.8%. Female student applicants went from 40% to 43%. Another example is our Milford Mill Academy Construction Design Management Program. We went from two students to nine. And again, this is in just one semester. And so we're really pleased with this work, but it's ongoing. We do it in small cohorts and scaling up has been a challenge for us, which is I think going to tie into our next slide that Sherry is going to talk a little bit about. So one of the challenges that um, we are as we're kind of getting into this next phase is really looking at this implementation of quality CT programs at the school level. So we wanted to show kind of a snapshot of what people are kind of working on. So on the right, we have an example of a CTE supervisor. Uh, this is one individual and um, who has one resource teacher who works part of the time with these programs, who oversees all these different um, career programs, everything from automotive to electrical to cosmetology to baking and pastry. So that is a wide range of skill set and pieces to manage different equipment and um, and really guidance to provide to teachers, many of whom are coming from the industry, not from a teacher's program. So we're also many are navigating, getting certification and pieces like that. So there's a lot that goes into supporting these programs from facilities to, um, to, to instruction and everything in between, including also the way they support the student organizations, as well as all of our programs also have advisory councils. So there's a lot of pieces there for one person to manage efficiently. So that's a, sort of from the centralized you know, support that happens. And then on the school side, what you see is this is an example of one department chair who um, oversees both science as well as CTE. And then example of all of the different um, CTE programs that you see from um, a department chair. And um, and so you can see that, you know, this is someone who probably has a, you know, a, maybe a science background and they're overseeing everything from business education to um, in interactive media production to JROTC, as well as all of the science uh, courses and teachers that they may be talking about. So what you see there is um, we've got a lot of people covering a wide range of things. And what we don't have is sort of a localized support at that school system to really serve as a connection between um, what we're seeing. And so, um, and so um, I think then, so as we're looking here, we're looking really at how can we build in that school-based leadership? And that's really this idea of site-based coordination and um, program expansion and industry credentials and really starting to support the work around youth apprenticeships. We think that as we start to increase this idea of school-based leadership, we'll have be able to better identify youth apprenticeships that work to support our communities and all of those kinds of pieces. All right, thank you, okay. Dr. Grubb and Ms. Fisher. Back to you. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Thank you all so much for that wonderful presentation. That was uh, very informative and um, we can open it up for questions. Actually, I can start. I wanted to know um, as far as certifications mm -hmm. go, if um, I'm a student, I take um, uh, baking and um, culinary arts at Solis Point and I, I'm want to know if I get a certification there. Is that same certification also offered at for students at like Western Tech where there is also a culinary program? Yeah, a great question. I was trying to look at another PowerPoint to slide over um, to show an example, but um, all of our programs have um, a technical skill assessment and that's that could be an end of course assessment or it could be an industry recognized credential. Most of our programs also have an industry recognized credential and that's just something that businesses value. It's been vetted by the, you know, the, the Maryland State Department of Education and again, just our business community. So for the baking example, um, we only have one baking pastry program. It's at Sellers Point. They all sit for the ACF certification. The culinary arts program that's also at Sellers Point, but it's at Eastern, Western and Carver they would all sit and be eligible for the ACF certification as well. One thing that I wanted to note was that three years ago, we were given funding to make sure no students pay for their industry credentials anymore. So there is, to answer your question, there is consistency. 
regardless of the program you're in, it's consistent across the school system. And um, I am pleased to share, no student has to pay. Five years ago, one principal might have been paying for the industry exam. Over here, a student may have been paying. Over here, we may have been picking up the cost. Now we pay for every single exam for our students, um, which is a, it's it's about two hundred fifty thousand dollars per year um, that we were given to make sure that students do not have to pick up that that cost. OK, OK, that's good to know. Thank you. It looks like there is a question from Mr. Thomas. Thank you so much. Thank you for that presentation. It was incredible and I love the Eastern Tech shout outs, although I'm, I love all of our high schools as well. Um, so my first question is about the distinction between magnet programs in, and CTE programs. I was in conversation with the CTE coordinator at Eastern Tech about the Teacher Academy of Maryland and we were discussing how at Eastern Tech, you know, it's a four year program. Students are taking the course every year and they have a required internship to be in a, in a, in a school as, as in a teacher intern. But for the CTE programs in other schools for TAM, it's just like one class. It's, it's kind of her interpretation so, or in our conversation. Can you elaborate on that? Is it still a four year like pathway in the CTE program? Are they still doing the internship? Is this internship still required? Yeah, great question. So um, from a fidelity standpoint, the Teacher Academy Maryland program should be implemented the same in every single school. Four courses, four credits. I think one of the distinctions is that at a magnet school, there is this high expectation that you're coming in and you're finishing the program. That's why you're there. You're taking all four courses. What we do see is in some of the comprehensive high school, um, they might come in and you might take Teacher Academy Maryland and take the first course and you may determine it's just not for you. And maybe you jump to another program of study. So in those instances, you might not be a full completer, but it is our expectation that at every single Teacher Academy in Maryland school, all four courses are offered um, and you do try to you know get to completion um, but there is no difference in teacher academy maryland program from school to school there shouldn't be at least okay and that's kind of the same for the academy of health professions and some of the other programs you know they still have that four-year track um it, if it's if the cte program versus if it's a yeah yeah and yep. the only distinction is that cte programs are open to everyone in that school and not just to so what if i was a sophomore and i wanted to joined him, but I didn't know it was a course offered in my freshman year because I was coming from the eighth grade and it wasn't advertised to me. Can I start my sophomore year, double up on TAM classes and finish it by my senior year? Yeah, great question. Um, so to, to be honest with you, it, it does vary by program. It becomes a little bit challenging. Like Project Lead the Way is a five course, five credit program of study. So if you start to get into your sophomore, junior year, we're going to let you come in as, and take that first course. We are always going to value experience over taking all five courses. The problem with some of the programs is if you become a sophomore or junior, you're not going to be able to finish all of them. But in your example, Tam, that's a really good example because if you're a sophomore, you can double up at some point or you have flexibility in the internship and you can actually complete the program. Um, it's You don't have to elect in freshman year and there's no turning back in our comprehensive high schools. That's at least how we hope it's implemented and, and designed. So great question. Awesome, and I'm super excited about the uh, Northwest Area CTE School and to get Sellers Point uh, on the other side of the county because um, as someone who applied to Sellers Point, I saw the value in that school. And uh, if I wasn't at Eastern Tech, I'd, I'd be going to that school half a day each year. So through it. Uh, my last question right. is. Oh, is this sorry. your last question? Yeah, because yes. I want to make sure because we're coming up on time. It's now yeah. been about two hours and it looks like there's a comment from Mr. Haney and a question from Dr. Hager. Sure. So who comprises the advisory councils that were mentioned for the CTE clusters? Are our parents able to join, students able to join? Can you say that one more time? I'm sorry. Yeah. Who comprises or who is a part of the advisory councils that uh, advise the CTE clusters? Yeah, uh, a great question. So um, for, for within BCPS, we have two different types of advisory councils. We have a locally local advisory council. Um, we have about 20 members. Um, that's mostly ind individuals from business, but a lot of our um, a lot of our members, when they apply, we ask if they're also a parent of a student in BCPS. I think at this point, about five out of 20 of our advisory councils also have children within BCPS. Um, and then at the program level, we also have program advisory councils. So there's an advisory council just for construction. There's an advisory council just for automotive. Um, and a lot of those advisory councils include students, parents, business members, it, it varies. Um, and we're always open and accepting more people to join our advisory councils, to be honest with you. So 
Um, it just varies program by program, but the door is open uh, for anyone that wants to join. Thank you. I'd, I'd love to. I'm going to reach out and ask more information about that. Thank you. Yeah, please do. Yeah. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Hager. So I know you have to sign off. Um, I can try and make sure my internet works. Um, I just uh, was asking about the PLTW comment that was made in the slide deck um, about it being present in the three magnet schools. Um, and I was going to ask, uh, I thought that it was in every school and I know that Miche, uh responded to my comment, but just to, to say it publicly, if you could answer it. Sure, I, I can, go or ahead. go ahead, Shay, I'm sorry. No, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so we have Project Lead the Way Engineering in eight high schools, three schools are magnet, we have Project Lead the Way Biomedical Science in eight high schools. Uh, we did have it in six. We expanded to two new schools. Uh, Woodlawn High School is the only one that has both biomedical and Project Lead the Way Engineering. Um, it is a program that we continue to expand because they have a very strong PD model and they don't just, um, you can bring really anybody from STEM in to teach it. So it's very appealing from a certification standpoint uh, because it's just, it's not like finding a journeyman for electrical. We could have a science, math, or even social studies teacher teach Project Lead the Way. Um, at the middle school level, we've actually expanded from, I think, 10 Project Lead the Way gateway programs to, I think, we're up to 16. Our hope is to get it in every single middle school in the near future. Um, it, the it's, uh, part, I'm sorry, the second part of our question was, what's the difference between the magnet programs and comprehensive? And I shared that's one of the things we're trying to fix because they're not different. <laughs> Yeah, the, the curriculum's the exact same. Teachers go to the same training, they get the same equipment. Um, just one school adds criteria and gets some additional funding and the other one doesn't. That's interesting. I, I'm a huge fan of that program. My, my daughter's in it and it's just an absolutely fantastic program. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great, thanks for that. And it looks like there's a comment from Mr. Handy. Mr. Uh, um, thank you. Yes, thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, you mentioned my comment already. I just wanted to, uh, you know, notice that we were a few minutes over time. So just wanted to offer, I can certainly feel questions from any committee members and make sure they make it over to um, our wonderful CTE team if, if there are any additional follow-ups. But just want to be mindful of time. I know a lot of folks yeah. have other appointments and just want to wrap up for the evening perhaps. So thank you. Absolutely, yes. Thank you for that. Um, and it looks like I don't see any additional questions in the chat and as always board members can email um, Mr. Handy or the team with additional questions for follow up. So um, the last item is on the agenda is announcements and um, I didn't know if there were um, any additional questions or announcements or anything. Mr. Thomas has his hand raised. Yes. Yes, Ms. Scott, uh, I just wanted to uh, say not an announcement, but just something to the committee on um, this. I, I would like to see a presentation and like report on the logistics for developing a multi year plan to implement gender neutral bathrooms in the schools that we have that aren't being newly reconstructed that already have them in them. So for the schools that don't have any replacement plans in the near future um, uh, to, to implement and in the, in the capital budget some requests for gender neutral bathrooms. So that's something I would love to see. Okay. Uh, Mr. Haney, is that something that can be presented at our March 17th board meeting? Uh, I will certainly work towards that, Ms. Scott, but I will take the agenda item and start to investigate and I will I will target March, our March meeting for that. So I will work on that. Great. OK, thank you. Yeah, you you're welcome. No? All right. Yeah, and thank you all so much. These were very informative, uh, very good presentations. So our next equity meeting committee meeting will be held Thursday, March 17th, and with that, um, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good everyone. Oh, Miss Scott, guess what? Good night. Oh, hello. Yes. Yeah, guess what, Miss Scott? I got into Emory University. Emory? In Atlanta? Yeah, yeah in Atlanta. Oh, God. Good for you. Congratulations, Thank you. Thomas. Thank I you, went Ms. to Kim. Clark for grad school and I applied to Emory Film School, so wonderful. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, Ms. Roswell. Okay, well, have a great night. Bye, Congratulations, everyone. Congratulations, everybody. Good night. <laughs>